No, he don't never give up on us. Sometimes we give up on him, but there's no one ever been found as faithful as he. There's a song that says that I think that uh, that group came to sing for us. Uh, no one but you, Lord, is that faithful. And, and that's true. If you have your Bibles, as the children to go through the message. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we open the book of Genesis and chapter 3. We're going to read verse 6, 7, and 8 in a moment. And for our text, but we're going to go through uh, uh, the message. We're going to go through uh, verse, uh, verse 20. We'll start with verse 21 next week. And, uh, and I hope that we're getting a lot of clarification as we go through here, taking it nice and slow and, and seeing why some things were said, why some things were done, and how they were done, and we can better understand uh, uh, creation. Because God, God told me that you have to understand the beginning before you can really understand the middle and the end. And uh, we're in the middle now. The ends are coming. So uh, if you're standing with me and I'm reading God's Word, the message title this morning is The Consequence of Sin. Beginning in chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and, the so, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord, God amongst the trees of the garden. And Father, we ask your blessing upon the reading of your word this morning. We ask you, Father, to bless our voice and our throat, Father, as we make ourselves available to the Holy Spirit. will use us to bring this message this morning, Father. As we see this, this, this terrible thing that came upon mankind because somebody was disobedient to you, Father. We pray, God, that you would instill in us the meaning of this message, Father, that we might go forward today better prepared and better warned and better alarmed and better armed to do due diligence with our enemy, O Satan, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Last week we looked at two perfect lives that were ruined by the vulture serpent who also was named, known in the Bible as Lucifer, Great Dragon, Devil, and Message. The message last week was sharing a good bit of the scriptures concerning a warning of him. And at the close, you remember, I gave you six facts from those first five verses that we should be aware of. So this morning, we're going to take up right where we left off uh, in the scripture we read. The first thing I want us to look at this morning, we're going to look at the characters involved here to start with. And the first one, of course, is the woman, Eve. Apparently, as you read the scriptures, apparently Eve is standing beside the forbidden at the moment of temptation. Now, who knows that that's a bad deal before you even look at it. Amen. Eve was standing beside the forbidden. As intelligent human beings, one of the first things we must understand is stay away from that which is destructive to us. If it's destructive, stay away from it. If you're standing close, close to the fire, then it's your fault if you get burned. Uh, we, we all know that. We, we teach our children that at an early age. Don't touch that. It's hot. You'll get burned. And of course, a lot of us have to touch it just to make sure we regret it. But hopefully we remember not to touch it anymore. You know, uh, uh, I grew up, uh, 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 to start with, we had the old wood cook stove and everything. Well, uh, one later time went by and mother finally got an electric stove. 
And uh, back then, when you turned those eyes on, they got red, red hot. And, and I never will forget. I, I went up there, and Mother turned around, and I walked up that snow, and in my eyes, they were so red, like a Christmas tree light, and I just had to lay, I'd take my hand and lay on that thing. I didn't lay it there long, and I've never done that since, you know. Got kind of like sticking your finger in a light socket. When you get burned, something you have to know. But isn't it better not to get me burned in the first place? Amen. I think so. So anyways, we go on. When God says there's one thing you must not do, what should you do? Stay away from it. Don't do it. If you hang out with a gang that commits a crime, it's almost impossible to prove you didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah. You know? there's, a, there's a thing called guilt by association. Yeah. And if you're involved in an armed robbery, you're involved in an armed robbery. Whether you had the weapon or not, if you're in a gang that's taking part in a robbery, and only one has a weapon, there's six of you, all six of you are going to be charged with armed robbery. You know, you shouldn't have been part of that gang to start with. And, and that's, that's what God looks at things. Is if it's wrong, if it's harmful, if it's destructive, leave it alone. Don't even get close to it. Don't, don't get curious as to, as to what might happen if you touch it. Because trust me, if you touch fire, you're going to get burned. Then, uh, being near it, her mind begins an evaluation. Every time we get near something we shouldn't have, our mind starts working on us. It's always going to be that way. She could see nothing about that tree that made it look bad. Now, when I go through these three things or four things here, think about that when, we're, when there's something we know we shouldn't do or have, but we're kind of interested and we look at it and we're intrigued by it. And, and the first thing that Eve noticed was there was nothing about this tree that looked harmful. It was pleasing to the eye. And, and, and Eve said, I just don't understand uh, what's harmful about this tree. The second thing she could not understand at all is why it should not be eaten. You know, you, you see this, this tree bearing this beautiful fruit, and, and God told her don't partake of it, and it looks so wonderful, it looks so delicious. She doesn't see anything wrong with it, and why shouldn't I eat it? And then she just could not understand why it was forbidden. Why does God put something in the garden, or allow something in the garden, and then forbid it to us? On the other hand, she looked at it, and it was pleasing to look at. It was pleasing. How many of you know that oftentimes sin is very pleasing to look at? I, I grew up, you know, uh, seeing these things, hearing about all these people that had the yachts and all the parties and all that stuff, you know, and, 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 and they go to church and go to church and say, they're not having any fun. Yeah, they are. I say, sure, it looks like they are. <laughs> they think they're having fun. That's the way that the devil disguises it, you know. Um, uh, she saw that it had a beautiful color. And it looked like it would be so sweet and delicious and fun to eat. You know, our mind starts telling us, yeah, you know, they tell you you shouldn't have this. But just think about how much fun it would be, you know. We do that a lot of time playing, playing bad tricks on individuals. Then the big one, she thought, it's what scripture is saying, she thought it would make her know more than she knows now. Remember it said that. She thought if she partook of it, that she would know more than she knows now. That, that she, would, she would have uh, more understanding, she had have more wisdom, and she would even know more than Adam, because Adam had partook of it. And what wife doesn't want to know more than her husband? You know? uh, she's thinking all these things. How do you know? She's a woman. She's a human. I should say that. She's a human. You know, men are the same way. You know, we, we like to get around what we shouldn't be around. We want to know if that rattlesnake's really going to bite or not. Well, anyway, she, she did the forbidden thing. She did her own lust. And she did not fall down there. How many times you? Well, I don't know why y'all say it's wrong. I did it. I didn't get hurt. 
I drank that. I didn't get sick. You know, and that's what she was thinking uh, when that happened. Uh, uh, Adam, Adam uh, was right there with him. That's the second point. What about Adam? The Bible says he was standing right there with her, contrary to what a lot of preachers want to preach. After I was saved, I wish I'd got saved at the age that, that uh, Isaiah did, but I wish I was 17. But after I got 17, I listened to what the preachers preached. I thought it was important. If I'm, if I'm going to be a Christian, I want to know what the Bible says. And, and, and almost every one of them preached that while Aaron was down there doing the work, Eve was over here where she shouldn't be. And ever since then, we've always blamed Eve. <laughs> we've always. She gets the raw end of the deal every time. It's Eve's fault. If Eve had not done that, then we wouldn't be doing all the have all the trouble we got today. Baloney. Adam was not off down there in the, in the holler riding the bull. <laughs> the Bible says he was there with her. I don't know why preachers can't read that. You know, I'm not the best reader, but I read that. Gave it to him who was there with her. He was right there. And God had told him, you're the boss. You're the head of your wife. Now, I know, ladies, some of you don't like that. But you better be glad because God gave that responsibility to me and not you. That's right, amen. Adam couldn't say he tried to. No, I mean, we'll get to that in a minute. The excuses they tried to give, they all found excuses, but God wouldn't buy any of them. He was there. He was supposed to have stopped her. Why did he not stop her? I don't know. I don't know if any of us know. Why didn't he stop her? Adam, your wife, <coughs> is about to do a deadly thing. Your wife is about to break the rules of God. And you're standing there with her. And you're watching her. You're watching her reach. And you didn't grab her arm back. You're watching her pull it off of the tree. And you didn't grab it and throw it away. You watch her start taking a bite of it. And you didn't slap it out of her mouth. What's wrong with you, Adam? We don't know. That's one of the questions we need to write down when we get to heaven. Look him up. Oh, you think he's in heaven? I know he's in heaven. But anyway, when you get there, say, where's Adam? Adam, why didn't you stop Eve? You know what he's probably going to say if he remembers it? I don't know if he remembers it. I doubt it. But if he doesn't, he'll say, I don't know. I don't know. Don't we do the same thing? We see somebody in our family, somebody we love, a friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, a school buddy. <coughs> we see people that we care about and love. We see them start to do things that are bad for them. Why don't we stop them? I don't know. <coughs> Preacher, do you always stop? No, I haven't. I don't know why we don't. But we don't. Adam didn't either. Well, There's a Jewish saying that Adam loved his wife so much that when he saw Eve partake of the fruit and he thought she was going to die, that he wanted to die with her, baloney. That, that sounds nice as a romance novel, but that wasn't it. That wasn't it at all. Well, how do you know? I know men. <laughs> so, that just didn't happen. Well, he joined her. And the Bible says both their eyes were open and they both knew well, they were naked. Now, they didn't have any clothes on to start with. God made them just like he made all of us. Coming into this world naked as a jaybird, as we say. <laughs> Who's ever had a baby that was dressed in a tuxedo? <laughs> <laughs> they all come into this world with no clothes. 
Not having any clothes is not a sin. Right. Not having no clothes and doing something sinful is a sin. And, and they had seen each other. They knew they didn't have clothes on. But when they partook of that, what was that forbidden tree? What was it, not, what was it called? No. The knowledge of good and evil. Up until this point, Adam and Eve, who were grown human beings, they were as innocent as God himself. They had done no wrong. God made them perfect and put them in a place of perfection and said, this is your home. And they messed it up. Their eyes weren't open, their physical eyes, but their, their physical eyes, their, their mental eyes, their heart eyes. Not to the wonderful things God had promised them, but to rather to the things that are distressing and disagreeable. Their eyes were open to the deception of the vulture serpent. That's how the devil operates. That's how he works on us. He, he, he makes it look so nice to us and so inviting. And we just have to do it. When Linda and I lived in Florida, there's a park out there called Mayaka State Park. And it has a river. And they, and they have a place up there, out there that looks so great for diving. You know, uh, guys, we know who, how we are. I mean, it looks like we want to play Tarzan. It, it, it's, a place, it's a place to stay in. And it just like so inviting. Big old signs there. I mean, it's like a billboard. It says, danger, do not dive. Danger, do not die. Danger, do not die. And this young dad of two, he ignored that sign. His desire for what he couldn't have, his desire to go against the rules, his desire to be his own man, he got up there, he dove off, hit his head on a rock, and he's been paralyzed ever since. This dad with a wife and two children became useless to them and required all their time and attention because he disobeyed the road and the warning. That's what Adam and Eve did this morning. They no longer were pure before God. And they went and tried to make those silly fig aprons. They knew that their relationship now was not with God the Creator. Their relationship with God now is God the eternal judge. Think about that. They went from God, God my Father, God my Creator, God my wonderful Master, God the one who takes care of me, provides for me. In a split second, it went to God my judge. What's going to happen to them? They tried to cover their sin, but God already did. Third thing, true love turns to blaming and backbiting. It always does in sin. Oh, we never going to tell on one another. Oh, no, you do it, I'm not going to tell. I'll never share it with anybody. It'll be our little secret. Nobody will ever know that this happened. Just you and me. It'll be our, it'll be our, our, our buddy, buddy secret. And as soon as trouble comes up, they can't wait to yap about it. They do it every time. They squeal. The world is a bunch of squillers when it comes down to saving their own hide. Yep. Right. Young ladies need to realize that. Right. From these lying, scheming boys. Yeah. Adam and Eve invented the game hide and go seek. They tried to hide from God in the forest that God had made. <laughs> he knew every tree in that forest. Everything. He, he created the place and they tried to hide in it. They heard God, Adam, where are you? And I put this in there. I see you. <laughs> you imagine Adam and Eve? 
with some fig leaves around them trying to get behind an oak or whatever kind of tree it is. God's up above them in a helicopter. He says, I see you. You can't hide from me. I'm God. The lesson there is we can't hide from him either. He knows every moment of where we're at. Adam answered, I'm hit because I'm naked before you. God gave him a little test. He said, who told you you're naked? Wow. Yeah. Then look at the blind game. Listen to what Adam said. This woman, <laughs> remember the one you brought to me? She invited me into her sin and I did it. Remember God, it was your idea to start with. I didn't ask for her. You brought her to me. I wasn't sad lonely. I just had a headache that day. You brought me this woman and look what she's done. Wow. Then God asked the woman, What is this that you have done? Eva responded, not Eva. <laughs> Eve responded. <laughs> Me in my mouth. Eve responded, that brought your servant. Remember, you created him. <coughs> and I said, you created her. Eve said, you created him. Passing the buck. Well, he seduced and see me, and I did it. But you were there, you made him. Joy for God. How many of you know God's not going to accept those excuses? I want to give a note about God's judgment, three things about it real quick. First, God's judgment is always just. God's judgment is always just. When he judges us, living or dead, here or there, when he judges us, whatever judgment he puts up, pronounces upon us, he's just in doing so because he knows every little dirty detail. Second thing, God is judge is just in judging anything because He created everything. Well, I don't know. I don't know why God's. I don't know why God's even interested in that. That's we're not affecting Him. Why is He? In, he has no business being in my life. Yes, He does. He created you. He created your life. That's why he's the just judge. Everything he judges, he created. And then number three, in the existence of all that we can know to exist anywhere other than the triune God, humans are the only ones created like God. God can judge us because he created us and we're like him. Parents are supposed to be parents of the children because he, they made them. They created them. And they have the responsibility to be their judge. Now, I know young people like to hear that. But when parents tell a young a child or a young person, no, you can't do that. It's harmful. You'll be in danger. They have a right to do so. Why do they have that right? Because God gave it to them. God gave them the responsibility to do to the children what he says he'll do to the adults. This one. But anyway, that brings us to our final point. The consequence of sin. First in the serpent, verse 14. Remember I said last week that the devil and demons are capable of taking over control of all animals which do not resist. And most animals are not going to resist. 
And that includes the highest form of animal, which is mankind. The devil, with his demons, are capable of taking over a human being. Now, I believe there's one exception to that. And that is that the Holy Spirit is actually living there. Amen. The devil Amen. cannot take over anything that belongs to the Holy Spirit. Amen. But he can take over anything you allow him to take over. He can't own it, but he can influence it. And I don't want to, I don't want to try to get gross here or say the wrong thing here. But let me tell you something about how this demonology works. Have you ever wondered why so often times we have a case where a battered wife finally leaves that husband, wife beat her husband, and no time at all she's found another just like him? Right. She gets rid of him, she finds another, he's another wife beater. Why is that? Why don't why do these wives learn from it? I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to try not, not to get graphic. But demons can be passed on yes. through the sexual experience. Right. Yeah. That's how it happens. And those demons in a person will help control, try to control a person's mental ability to reason against what they want you to do. And that's why that is. There's people, I hear people, I don't know why in the world she thought a love man just like one she had. That's why. <laughs> she hasn't done anything to get rid of those demons in her, and she passes them on to him. He may not have been there. Wow. Anyway, let's go on. We got more. We don't get too bad here. <laughs> Having said that, as far as the order of the reptile species, since we have no knowledge of knowing exactly the appearance and function at this point up to then, we do not know how harsh the punishment is for what we call the snake. Since you will crawl on your bed and you eat of the dust. And my thought there is I'm kicking you out of the garden into the desert. And remember this beautiful, lush garden. All around it is desert. Talk about an oasis. The Garden of Eden was an oasis in the desert. So to speak. And he said to the serpent, the snake, you're going to crawl on your belly. Now we're going to get to another part of that in just a moment. You're going to eat of the dust. I figured that was just out there. And then he goes on in verse 15. Now he says, as far as the vulture serpent, Satan, this is what he said, verse 15. I, God, will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and you shall bruise his heel. That word enmity there means hostility or hatred. It comes from the root word meaning to hate as one of an opposite tribe or party to be hostile to an enemy. Hostility to between Satan and humanity. That's what God said. That there's hatred. I'm telling you, the devil doesn't love us. He hates us. And we shouldn't love him. We're supposed to hate him. I was raised not to say bad things about people. Well, the devil's not people. He's the devil. He's a scumbag. He's a liar. He's a traitor. Between the seed here means the offspring that comes from them. The seed from the vulture serpent, devil, would be demons, the antichrist, the false prophet, Satan worshiper, and the unsaved. Wait a minute, preacher. Now you've gone too far. You're calling people ain't saved a uh, children of the devil. No, God did it. God says it. God says the unsaved person who has reached the age of accountability, you are the child of your father, Satan. Right. You mean that makes me that bad? No, it makes you that lost. Yeah. 
A lost person, the only prayer that God wants to hear from them is that they be saved in the name of your son by his blood, by his death on the cross, by his resurrection, by his ascension, by his coming again. Let me be saved. The rest of them is just dumb luck if a lost person gets what they pray for. Well, I don't know if you were to say that, Calvin. Well, I am saying that. God has made no promise to lost people except I'll give you the opportunity to become saved. Mm -hmm. I've heard from it. Well, he never gave me no opportunity. I never, never had no feeling I wanted to get saved. That's a lie. <laughs> There's not a human being Whoever reaches the age of accountability that before their death, God gives them an opportunity to be saved. It may not be in church. It may not be with a visit from, from a good church member. It may not be in a gospel singing. It may not be at the movie, the Ten Commandments. It may be alone in a walk through the woods. It might be like a young boy says, I started to say my prayer and I knew I needed to be saved. Yeah. Come on. I believe the Bible promises that God gives every human being who reaches the age of accountability at least one chance, one opportunity to be saved. Amen. Thankfully, he gives most of us many. Mm -hmm. But he only has to give one. There was two thieves on that cross that day that Christ was hung on. Both of them exactly alike. Both of them were thieves. Both of them deserved to be punished with death. The only innocent one there was in the middle dying for them too. One of them laughed at him and mocked him and scorned him and said, prove you're the son of God. The other having listened and saw it all he said, Lord, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Amen. Jesus turned to that one and said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Mm -hmm. Now he didn't turn to the other one and said, you're going to hell, sucker. He didn't do that. He didn't have nothing to say to him. It was over. He had his opportunity. He squandered it. God owed him no more. That other thief died and went to hell. Mm -hmm. How do you know? Because that's where the Bible says they go. That's right. All right, let's go on. And I'm going to hush short short. The bruising of the head and the heel is prophecy of Jesus Christ. Satan bruising the heel of Jesus Christ is a picture of Satan being able to only produce non-lethal wounds. Who ever heard of somebody dying because they hurt their heel? But on the other hand, Jesus will make the bruising attack on Satan's head, which is a deadly wound. Mm -hmm. In other words, God is telling Adam and Eve that one day this old serpent is going to bruise my son. But it won't kill him. You can't kill him. I still say you can't kill God. That's right. That's right. But God can give up his breath. The son can give up his breath and say, let's take me home, Father. But to the other one, he squandered it. He squandered it. And he's dying. He gets the wound. The devil will get the wound to the head. Second, the consequence of the woman or women. This is where you women fuss when the delivery time comes. God will multiply her sorrow. That word means a worrisome of this. Sorrow and toil. Very seldom have I ever, I don't, I don't know if I've ever met a woman who goes through that normal, what I, I say normal, the, the average, the average process of life. You grow up, you know, you get married, you have babies, and you grow old and go to heaven. I don't believe I've ever met a woman who didn't have times of great worrisome in their life. Things that were just worrisome enough to cause them just to want to crawl up in a corner and die. I've never met one. I'm not saying it's all the time, but 
the responsibilities that God put on women, we think we got it tough. You ever try being a woman? Amen. No, I haven't because I haven't tried. <laughs> I've never prayed. Lord, let me be a woman for a week. I've never prayed that prayer. Don't want to pray that prayer. If you pray it, God's going to say, no, he don't want it. That worship is brought upon them because of their grave responsibility. The process of childbirth will be labor intensive. And boy, is that the truth. Yep. Women love to have children because that's a God-given thing to them. God gives the female the desire to have children. Not all, not all can, and not all does. And it's not a sin not to. But there's something, just like the, the, the at some point in there, they, they, there's a move of God, you need to be saved. <coughs> there's something about women that they, they, they know that they want to have children. Some of them wait late in life. They have a great career and everything, and then they say, I want to have a child. You? At your age, I just tell you, I want to have a child. The husband will have rule, dominion, and governorship over the wife. That's worse than enough right there, right, ladies? <laughs> well, I don't know why you put that in there. Well, because he's given the man the responsibility over the household. It was Adam's responsibility to stop Eve. And he didn't do it. That's just something ladies you got to learn to live with. <coughs> then the consequences of the man are men. Verse 79. God said you should have listened to me instead of Eve. There is no relationships that humans can have that should override what God says. <coughs> no relationship. Human beings cannot have a relationship that should take priority over God. It should not be. And I'm going to say it here, and it's going to be on video. Christians that did not go to church this morning, and they were perfectly able to go this morning, they have committed sin against Jesus Christ. Right. Preacher, how do you say it? Because the Bible says, don't repeat yourself assembly with my people. The church, the children of God. Now we know sometimes it can't be helped. There's sickness, there's work. And once in a while, there's vacation. But those who have no, who are not in church today, in any church, and they claim to be Christian, and they were perfectly capable of going to church, they committed sin against Jesus Christ this morning. That's right. Well, I know that doesn't get the flock to come in, <laughs> but it's the truth. It is. I'd rather have 12 here with the truth than the 1,200 with the lie. Amen. That's right. When I leave Mount Zion Baptist Church, the one thing this church is going to have to say about me, he preached the true word of God. That's right. He didn't do it well, maybe, but he preached it. <laughs> well, i got to go on. The most dangerous phrase that human beings could utter may just be, I know what God says, but. How many times do you hear that in a week? Well, I know the Bible says this, but. You better get rid of that big but. Right. Now, I'm, not talking, I'm not talking dietary. I'm talking about mental thinking. Whenever you catch yourself saying that, you need to slap yourself in the mouth. Say, no, I'm not going to say that. If the Bible says it, it's God's word, it's law, that's it. No man, no woman can change it. That's right. <laughs> God said, instead of lush food for the garden, you will eat of what the desert, the desert can produce for you. Produce for you. Wow. Imagine that. Now, I don't know what was all in that lush garden. I know there wasn't no ham hops hanging because they were all vegetarian. <laughs> there wasn't no fried chicken. 
No long John Silver. Well, there might be that, but God didn't say fish all right after a while. <laughs> Can you see part of Eden with 35 long John Silver? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you can think of being deliciously tasteful, the melt in your mouth good, it was in that garden. And Adam and Eve had free reign of it. Now, before we get to the next part of what we're talking about his children, they were going to have children anyway. Let me back up here a minute. Having children is not the curse. No. The labor intensiveness, that's the curse. Right. Remember when God created them way back in message one or two? He said, be fruitful and multiply. Yeah. He said that to everything, the birds, the fish, the animals, and mankind. Be fruitful and multiply. They didn't know how. Remember I said it might be like a chicken going here and lay one? I don't, they didn't know how it was going to happen, but they knew they were going to have children. This is not a, a curse to have children. Children are not a curse. They're a blessing. Amen. This is a curse. It's a pain. Let me go on. I ain't got much longer. God said instead of that, you're going to eat in the desert. God then describes plants that probably, I'm pretty sure, were not in the garden. This is what he says. Thorns and thistles shall the desert bring up. Now apparently there had not been any, there was not any thorns and thistles in the desert until that time. Thorns and thistles are here to punish us. We've been doing some land clearing. Well, I haven't. Some, some of my good sons, son-in-laws and grandsons have been doing it. And on the back side, there's some deadly thorns and thistles. I mean, those things are that long. And sharp as sharp can be. And you, you got that vine, you think it's just an innocent vine, and you pull and you're attacked. That thing comes and wraps around you, and you're being stuck in seven, seven ways to Sunday, as we say. I knew how to know what that meant. <laughs> Byron can tell you a little bit about those thorns, can't you, Byron? Yes, sir. He got one just there. They'll get you. And they'll come close to making you cuss. I'm just telling you. I don't know about the sailor. They come close to making a preacher cuss. I'm just being honest with you. I didn't. But they hurt. And you kind of feel dumb for grabbing that vine. Anyway, uh, not for Adam's advantage, but to give him more trouble and cause him additional fatigue and sorrow to root them up. Most of us know how painful they are. Then God says, you will not eat of the garden, but the herbs of the desert can produce. You'll be eaten like the animals. Wow. Wow. Instead of gathering the fruit or having your wife do it in the garden like a king, you're going to be out here eating like the animals. Yep. Everything. Then look at verse 19. God says two huge things here and then we're going to close. This is a life sentence, sentence on humans to have to toil for a living. If you read that verse, let me go back, let me read it. In the sweat of thy face. Now he's talking to Adam, but he's talking to humans. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. When is that? When we die. Right. This is a lifelong sentence to us. We are supposed to have to toil on this earth. It's not wrong to make your children learn, learn to mow the lawn or to milk the cow or to feed the pigs, salt the pigs, feed the cows. That's part of life. In other words, we are supposed to work. That's part of it. That's the lifelong. The second thing, God, then God describes what happens to human bodies at death. 
He says, For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Yep. That verse is being quoted at the graveside, don't tell how many billions of times. God said, I created you from the dust of the earth. Isn't that what we learned? Yes, Everything else he spoke it into existence. He got to Adam, he picked up a handful of dirt. <laughs> he said, you're made from dirt, and you go back to dirt. And let me tell you, it doesn't matter if they plant this old body in the ground with nothing but a blanket, or if they put it in a wicker basket, or if they put it in a $100,000 coffin, and she does, I'll come back and hold her. <laughs> and put it in the best mausoleum in the world. That body is going to return to the dust. It doesn't matter where you put it. It's going to return to the dust. And a gold coffin will not prevent that. That's right. Okay, I'm going to close. I want to close with an important statement. We have, we have talked about some things that happened as a result of disobedience or sin. But we need to understand, now you notice that I did not put an S on the end of the consequences. It's not consequences here, what we know. That the consequence of sin is the loss of favor and fellowship with God. Right. We're going to get into the... the aspects of sin, some problems with sin, some things that happen in the next message. But that's the reason why I got that title was I started reading this and I thought with all this other stuff the consequence for sin is to be absent from God. Mm -hmm. Whatever amount of sin we have in our lives we're turning that amount from God. Then when you get enough, you turn completely. And you can't even think God's in your mind. Sin separates human beings from God. That is the consequence. Why they come and get us